be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Ankur Agrawal, Head Investor Relations and M&A at CoForge Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Aman. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today for our CoForge Earnings Conference Call. As you are aware, uh, we announced our Q4 and full year FI2023 results today. They've already been filed with the stock exchanges and they're also available on the investor section of our website. Uh, I have with me today uh, our CEO, Mr. Suhi Singh, our Chief Customer Success Officer, Mr. John Spate, our CFO, Mr. Ajay Kalra, and our Deputy CFO, Mr. Saurabh Gurin. As always, we'll start with the opening remarks from the management team, and post that, we will open the floor for your comments and questions. With that, I would now like to hand it over to our CEO, Mr. Sudhir Singh. Sudhir, all yours. Thank you very much, Ankur. And now, very good morning, very good evening to all of you across the world, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for joining us. I'm pleased to share that despite the uncertain macros, quarter four has been a successful quarter for the firm. Our growth in quarter four has not just been robust. It has equally importantly been broad-based across our verticals, across our service lines, across regions and across client size-based cohorts. We remain steadfast in our belief that organizations and teams that excel at execution are always the best placed to face and negotiate headwinds like the ones that the industry faces today. We remain focused on execution and we remain committed to driving robust, sustained and profitable growth despite the ambient challenges in fiscal year 24 as well. I'm also pleased to share that fiscal year 23 was a milestone year for the firm and we crossed the US $1 billion mark. We believe that we shall look back at fiscal year 23 as not just the year where we crossed the US $1 billion mark, but also equally importantly, as a year where we laid the foundation for an accelerated growth journey towards the next revenue milestone of US $2 billion through the very significant investments to enhance the firm's capabilities that we did make in fiscal year 23. Our employees continue to be the architects of our growth journey and their commitment reflected over the years is one of the in one of the highest employee retention and the lowest employee attrition rates that CoForge prides itself on has driven us and will continue to drive us in the future as well. To mark the US $1 billion revenue milestone, the firm will, starting tomorrow, gift all active employees with an Apple iPad. With that quick context, let me start with an overview of our performance in quarter four fiscal year 23. Starting off with the revenue analysis, I'm pleased to report that during the quarter, the firm registered a sequential revenue growth of 4.7% in constant currency terms, 5% in US dollar terms, and 5.6% in Indian rupee terms. The growth, particularly important in an environment like this, was broad-based. The BFS vertical grew 4.5%, quarter-on-quarter quarter in CC terms. The insurance vertical grew 5% quarter-on-quarter quarter in CC terms. The travel vertical grew 2.54% quarter-on-quarter in CC terms. And the other verticals together grew 6.4% quarter-on-quarter in CC terms. Clearly broad based growth. Our top five clients and our top 10 clients grew 23.9% and 26.6% year-on-year, respectively. And they contributed 23% and 35.5% respectively to our overall quarter four revenue. As I remarked in earlier calls, we derive a lot of our confidence in driving surprise-free sustained growth from our lack of over-dependence on a single or a group of client relationships. 
Our strong sequential revenue growth performance comes despite headwinds in the BFS sector, particularly in our mortgage portfolio. Overall, as a firm, we see the growth of the firm during the quarter as a reflection of the very strong execution engine that the firm has built, the deep client relationships that remain resilient, and our ability, even in an, in, in an environment like this, to continue to identify, to chase, and to close large deals. I shall now move on to the margins and the operating profits commentary. Our quarter four gross margins sequentially increased by 71 bips, following an earlier sequential increase of 133 bips in quarter three. The gross margin for quarter four was 34.1%. Our quarter four adjusted EBITDA margin sequentially increased by 109 bips and was at 19.6% for the quarter. Our ability to not just hold the line but to expand gross margin and EBITDA margin sequentially once again reflects the strong execution ethos of the organization. The increase in adjusted EBITDA was driven by a material increase in utilization by a continued increase in offshoring revenue percentage and the relative absence of furloughs that we encountered in quarter three. The consolidated profit after tax for the quarter, excluding one-off charges, stood at Indian rupees 2,327 million. The reported pack for the quarter was Indian rupees 1,148 million. The quarter saw two one-off expenses. The first is on account of expenses linked to the US $1 billion milestone celebrations, primarily the gift of an Apple iPad to each one of our 21,000 plus employees to mark the occasion. The second is on account of provisions done against ADR expenses so far. Moving on to the annual performance and I'll start once again with the revenue analysis. We registered a consolidated revenue of US dollar 1,001.7 million, cross to billion, and we have clocked a growth of 22.4% in CC terms for the year. In US dollar terms, that translates to 15.6%, and in Indian rupee terms, to 24.6%. You will recall that at the beginning of fiscal year 23, we had provided a revenue growth guidance of around 20% CC growth for FY23. We had subsequently revised it upwards in quarter three to at least 22% CC growth. Our revenue performance for the year is in line with our track record of meeting and exceeding the revenue guidance every year for the last six years. Vertical-wise performance for the year was as follows. BFS grew 47%, travel grew 21.5%, insurance declined 3.7%, and the other segment grew 23.1% in CC terms. Geographically, for us, Americas grew 16.3%, EMEA grew 37%, and the rest of the world grew 7% in CC terms during the year. Annual performance, margins, operating profits, the commentary reads as follows. We are pleased to report that in fiscal year 23, our gross margin increased by 55 bits, 55 bits to 32.5%. The increase has allowed us to significantly expand our investments in sales and capability built throughout the year. The adjusted EBITDA margin for the year stood at 18.3%. It is important, I think very important to note that during fiscal year 23, we incurred a hedge loss of Indian rupees 239 million versus a hedge gain of Indian rupees 224 million in fiscal year 22. And just that adverse swing on the hedge gain loss has led to a negative impact of about 60 bips on the EBITDA margin. Commentary around the order intake. One of the highlights of our quarter four performance was the continued clocking of large deals and a very high level of order intake despite the strong prevailing headwinds across our industry. The total order in intake for the quarter was 301 million USD. This is the fifth consecutive quarter where we have clocked an order intake of more than 300 million US dollars. With our performance in Q4, we closed fiscal year 23 with the highest ever recorded yearly order intake of 1.3 billion US dollars. 
equally important, particularly at a point like this and a time like this. During the quarter, we signed two large deals. They came from the BFS and from the travel sector, respectively. From an annual perspective, fiscal year 23 was a landmark year in that we signed 11 large deals through the year, of which two were over 50 million US dollar TCV and five were over 30 million US dollar TCV. Our deal pipeline continues to be both robust and resilient, as exemplified by our quarter four performance. We expect this deal momentum to continue in quarter one fiscal year 24 as well. The executable order book, which reflects the total value of locked in orders over the next 12 months, stands at a record US dollar 869 million. This number was US dollar 720 million a year back. The confidence that you will see in our revenue forecast guidance for fiscal year 24 in this commentary later also stems from the next 12 months committed order book, which continues to be unimpaired. 10 new logos were signed during the quarter, taking the total count to 44 for the full financial year. Finally, as I round up the section, I wish to note that during the quarter, we also signed up as a preferred technology partner with one of the largest retailers in the world. Now, this is not a large deal, but our partnership status now and the size of the wallet that we will address as this re retailer is what makes this a material even pass. People front, good metrics again. Our total headcount at the end of quarter four fiscal year 23 stood at 23,224. And we saw a net addition of 719, which is an increase of 3.2% net to our headcount during the quarter. Now this net headcount increase has come despite a very significant expansion in utilization by 120 bits. Utilization during the quarter stood at 81.5%. Our LTM attrition for the quarter fell further and fell again and is now at 14.1%. We remain, and we've talked about this in the past, we remain one of the lowest, if not the lowest, attrition firms across the industry. Those comments, I will now hand over the call to John Spate, Chief Customer Success Officer for providing insights into our operations and our capability creation initiatives. John, all yours. Thank you, Sadeh. I shall now touch upon the highlights of the quarter related to our delivery operations. In the insurance sector, CodeForge continues to grow its Duck Creek business, all on the back of successful implementations and upgrades across the US and Europe. A real positive move in this quarter has been the successful expansion into new areas, Australia and New Zealand. For a leading US life and annuity insurance carrier, we successfully completed a major enterprise-wide business transformation program to simplify their processes, drive operational efficiencies, thereby delivering significant cost savings for them. We also helped the top 100 US carrier successfully complete a multi-year tax compliance program, enhancing their legacy policy admin systems to ensure their life insurance products were compliant with the latest IRS regulations. Our Advantage Go business successfully launched its new retail system, leading with our proprietary underwriting workbench that connects the best of breed data providers to provide real time exposure insights to underwriters. In our TTH business, we successfully enabled a leading airline's major transformation journey involving one of the largest and most complex migrations of airline passenger service systems. We leveraged our travel domain capabilities our global Amedia certified engineering team, our proven agile delivery frameworks, and more than 12,000 business test case automations to execute the migration successfully and on plan. Moving to our BFS business, a tier one bank recently appointed us as their strategic data and analytics partner to help them accelerate their cloud adoption, analytics and visualization initiatives across the bank. We are leveraging our strong partnerships with AWS, Snowflake, Databricks, Microsoft to help drive their transformation programs by delivering best-in-class solutions. Pekka 
continues to be a strength of CoForge. Recently, we closed a major 18-month program of work for another global bank in which we are combining EGA, data, quality engineering capabilities to help drive our digital transformation agenda. We are also seeing sustained growth in our Salesforce business, underpinned by our new industry-specific solutions. For example, we have recently rolled out our Broker 360 management solution for insurance customers. Built on Salesforce Service Cloud and Experience Cloud, this solution provides our customers with a complete view of the activities performed by their agents and brokers. The growth is recognized by ISG, with CoForge named as a leader in the Salesforce application managed services and as a rising star in Salesforce mid market implementation services. We continue to explore and invest in our network central excellence. In collaboration with our technology partners, we have developed expertise that enables the creation of digital humans. We are now working with our customers to help them integrate digital humans along with AI and chatbots to create lifelike customer experiences within the metaverse. Our continued focus on metaverse and web three technologies was recently recognized by HMS when they awarded us enterprise innovator status in their 2023 Horizon support for metaverse service providers. Recognizing the importance of cyber security, we have invested to extend our services in this area, adding threat intelligence services to our extensive portfolio. We can now leverage our advanced capabilities in areas such as dark web and deep web monitoring, brand protection, and cyber threat intelligence to help secure the safety and privacy of information assets. To conclude, I will update you on our constant endeavor to upskill employees globally. We continue to invest in technical and domain training and certification programs. Our focus continues to be on core engineering skills, such as AWS, PEGA, Appium, Azure, Service Now, GCP, ISTQB. However, we have now also extended our learning programs to train teams in areas such as how to navigate leadership transitions, and how to build the structure. With that, I conclude the update of our media operations, and I would now like to hand over to AJ for further details on the financials. Over to you, AJ. Thank you, John. Uh, let me briefly touch upon the key balance sheet uh, items and tax metrics. Our cash and cash uh, and bank balances at the end of financial year 23 stood at $73.4 million compared to previous quarter of $22.4 million net of working capital drawings. The capital expenditure during the quarter was uh, US dollars for $4.3 million. Uh, million. The day sales outstanding were 61 days in Q4 versus 73 days in Q3 in INR terms. In US dollar terms, the DSO were 59 days for quarter four compared to 68 days in quarter three. The effective tax rate for quarter four uh, financial year 23, excluding the one of uh, charges which we mentioned, was at 18.3%. And for the full year, uh, for full year financial year, it was 20.4%. The operating cash flow for the full year 23 was about 68% of the reported EBITDA. As you are aware, CoForge had filed an ADR for which we had incurred an expense of INR 523 million rupees uh, over the last 18 months. These expenses were reflected as recoverable from the selling shareholders in our balance sheet. As the market conditions continue to be unfavorable for the ADR issue, basis accounting prudence, a provision of INR 523 million for these expenses has been made in Q4 FY23. We will continue to watch market conditions to see if a favorable window opens for the ADR. Additionally, the board has approved an amount of uh, US dollars, 11.5 million towards gift to all the employees and celebrations across all the patients for achieving US dollar 1 billion milestone. An amount of US dollars 9.8 million towards gifts has been incurred in quarter four financial year 23, and the balance celebration amount will be incurred in quarter one financial year 24. With that, I will hand over the call back to Subir for his comments on our flow. Thank you very much, Ajay. Uh, 
And as I had mentioned exactly a year back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in our then quarterly conference call, we had started planning towards our next revenue milestone of US $2 billion. And fiscal year 23, the year that closed, was all about proactively putting the right building blocks in place for that goal and beyond. During the year, we have significantly invested in and bolstered the front-end leadership teams, our capabilities, and the execution machinery across the organization. During the year, we also initiated a new organization structure to position us well for this journey to the US $2 billion revenue milestone. The new org structure focuses on scaling existing key accounts to US $100 million and $50 million each, leveraging a broader ecosystem of alliances and deal advisors, charging up the revenue hunting engine and creating differentiated service offerings. The core verticals will work as global integrated business units, and the service lines have been reclassified into six global horizontal business units, which will be market-facing and actively contribute to revenue growth. The new org structure has already been rolled out effective 1st of April, 2023. This new structure that is now settled with teams that are now clearly primed, the continued large deal wins, the strong executable order book, a resilient deal pipeline, anticipated broad-based growth across our core businesses gives us confidence that we shall continue to drive robust, sustained, and profitable growth in fiscal year 24 as well. For fiscal year 24, our revenue growth guidance is 13 to 16 percent growth in constant currency terms. On the profitability front, we expect a gross margin to increase by about 50 bips in fiscal year 24 over fiscal year 23 and adjusted EBITDA margin to remain at similar levels as fiscal year 23. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude our prepared remarks and all of us open the floor to all of you for your comments and your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the test room telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Participants connected on the video link, please click on the raise hand button on the toolbar or the Q&A tab and click raise hand. The operator will announce your name when it is your turn to ask a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Vibor Singhal from Novama Equities. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking my question. And congrats on a very strong performance uh, yet again. We've just got accustomed to getting surprised by the company every quarter. Uh, so, Sudhika, so uh, basically, if I could just start uh, uh, with the visibility that you have for, uh, for the guidance for FI24. Uh, we ended the year uh, with an order backlog, uh, MC 12 month executable order of, of backlog, which is up 21% on a buy and buy basis. And uh, we are guiding to uh, basically the um, uh, growth of 16 16%. So uh, just wanted to take your uh, take on what is the visibility that you have, uh, let's say, uh, towards the top end of the guidance, given that we are ending the year at such a strong growth in the executable order book. So the, does that mean that you might expect some slowdown on a buy on buy basis, it's not necessarily a decline, but maybe a deceleration on a buy on buy basis, the order in full the first half of the year, or do you think uh, uh, the demand environment remains strong uh, enough for us to be able to do this guidance, and of course, uh, uh, take it as we see it uh, during the course of the year? Well, uh, Vibor, uh, mathematically, we need to clock uh, roughly around 3% sequential growth every quarter over four quarters on an average to get 15%. If you look at our track record uh, around execution, the guidance that we've given at the end, in the beginning of the year over the last two years, we've been able to revise it both those years upwards and then exceed it by the time the year ends. So 13 to 16% clearly is something that we believe is in the realm of the possible. Uh, the RAM that we have because of the quarter four uh, growth, the fact that large deals pipeline continues to be resilient 
and large deals continue to be closed also gives us a lot of comfort. The order executable number, which is the next 12 month orders booked at 869 million is more than, is roughly about 20% more than where it was at the same time last year. So there's a lot of comfort that we derive from that as well. Large deal velocity has continued unimpaired. Order intake has been at more than 300 odd million dollars for five quarters running. Uh, so we feel we feel that uh, the guidance that we're giving you is is is, is clearly in the realm of the possible. Our intent, as always, will be to try to hit the upper end and hopefully, if all goes well, try to exceed it also over time. Got it. That's really helpful. Uh, really great to hear that. Uh, my second question was on the margin front. Uh, so uh, I think this year also we saw a very good expansion in the gross margin front, uh, but slightly lower at the end. That, of course, as you had mentioned, that we are investing a lot uh, in our uh, sales capability. And for the next year also, you just dive to the same thing that we're looking to expand our gross margins to 50, which is fine. Uh, but the uh, overall uh, EBITDA margins, uh, adjusted EBITDA margins might remain uh, flat. Uh, so just wanted to understand, I mean, uh, uh, do you believe this uh, uh, higher than, uh, uh, I mean, the last year kind of uh, investment in sales and marketing to, uh, will continue uh, and that, that will continue to have that gap between the gross, gross margin expansion and the uh, EBITDA margin expansion? And just a related bookkeeping question, uh, if uh, we could just maybe get a broad idea as to how much could be the gap between uh, reported and adjusted with the margins in FI24. Yeah, so uh, the second question is something that I'm going to deflect to Ajay. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we got. Yeah. As far as the uh, margin issue is concerned, a very key point to note also is that if you look at FI23 performance of the firm, there's a 60 bips mm -hmm. negative that has come just on account of the hedge gain loss. Right, so the 18.3 percent that we reported for fiscal year 23 would have been 60 bits higher had the hedge gain loss not played out the, the way it has. Uh, going into FY24, we are confident of, of a continued expansion in gross margin from where we are right now, but we are equally committed to making sure that most, if not all of it, gets funneled into additional investments into capability build, into uh, into solution build, into sales enhancement. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough macro. Uh, we do want to meet the guidance. We do want to exceed the guidance if it's possible. And the intent is going to be to keep pressing the pedal and make sure that, uh, that the capabilities and the investments are helping us power growth at a time like this. Ajay, would you like to take question number two, please? Sure. Uh, the difference between the EBITDA and the adjusted EBITDA is primarily the cost of uh, employee stock options. Uh, the current year options, the cost for, uh, would be uh, would, would decline and would be around uh, 60 bits uh, for the next financial year. However, uh, the uh, the options which are given in the uh, current year, they are not factored in there, and we will update that uh, in our next earnings call. Got it. So it's going to be north of 60 basis points. 60 basis point is for our year ones, plus on top of that, whatever the cost of this year's resource will be, that will be over and above that. That is, that is correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vivek. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks, everybody, for, for uh, your valuable time and wish you all the best. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Abhishek Bhandari from Nomura. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, sir, I had two questions. Uh, first is on the insurance vertical. You know, finally, we have started seeing, you know, some sequential, you know, growth momentum picking up. If you could help us, you know, understand how should we think about this vertical in FY24, given that it has been a laggard and we have been, you know, trying to do some leadership change there. Are you seeing a sustained momentum of growth coming back here? I think uh, the answer is a clear, uh, unqualified yes. Uh, it's been a 5% sequential growth. The way we look at our insurance businesses, our insurance business on the PNC side is largely focused on commercial specialties, small and medium uh, players. That place, the transformation spends are continuing and our partnerships are working very well. So there's a clear continued growth vector that applies there. The second thing that's happened on the insurance side is our expansion into newer geos within the insurance vertical has played out very well. I talked about 10 new logos. Four of them actually came from insurance across APAC largely centered around Australia. So that element is working well. On the LNA side, there is pressure when it comes to discretionary spending, but looking at our top 10 clients in that space, looking at a grounds up view. 
we think growth there again is going to be resilient. So the answer, the short answer to your question is yes. We believe the turnaround that we've seen actually it's a fairly significant turnaround that we've seen on the insurance side will sustain. What I do also want to call out is next year, this year, if you look at the dispersion across business units, it was very stark in our case. BFS was just on a tier. Insurance was pulling us down. Next year, the guidance that we've offered, we believe all the three core verticals will more or less be in line, centered around that growth guidance number and deliver growth numbers that will be roughly similar. So insurance should turn in a performance where the growth should be indicatively around 15% for the year as we see it now. Got it. Thank you, sir. So the second question is on your, you know, longer term margin outlook. You know, while for this year your aim is to improve 50 bips on GM and, you know, refunnel that into sales and marketing. But eventually, where would you want to, you know, uh, stabilize on your sales and marketing expenses? You know, we are already closer to 14 and a half percent, you know, kind of number. Um, do you think uh, maintaining this kind of SNM is necessary for the growth to remain where it is? Or eventually you can taper it off to, you know, more like a 12 to 13 percent number, what we have seen in the past? So I was like uh, six years back, the SGM reform was roughly around 19%. We brought it down very drastically through COVID all the way down to 12 and a half percent. We're now at about 14 odd percent. The way we look at uh, adjusted EBITDA versus SNM investments is the plan that we created internally around hitting a two billion dollar mark envisages that at two billion dollars revenue, the firm will have an adjusted EBITDA that is at least 150 bits higher than where we are, and on the outside all the way up in a good scenario, 300 bips higher than where we are. So it's obviously going to be a pull and a push depending on the year. This year is a tough year. We want to keep pushing the pedal to make sure growth is maximized. And hopefully some of the results of these investments will play out next year, possibly even this year, in taking the revenue needle and the revenue growth rates much higher. Thank you, sir, and all the best for FI24. Thanks very much, Avishek. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equivalent Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Congrats on our great contribution. Uh, Sandeep, the first question is uh, in terms of uh, entry into the voice. Is not very clear. May I request you use the handset, please? Virgin Yeah, is it clear now? Yes. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Shubhi, the first question entering FI24, uh, do you believe most of the portfolio specific issues are largely behind uh, in terms of uh, COCO, where you are now turning positive even on insurance? And second related question, uh, are you witnessing any client specific issues because of the increased macro pressure, especially with the exposure with some of the regional banks uh, in some of your acquired subsidiary SNK in the mortgage business as a whole? Yes, Sandeep, thanks for the thanks for the question. Portfolio specific, we believe, and I just answered the question, insurance is on a clear turnaround. Portfolio specific, we also believe that the dispersion across the business units in terms of growth is not going to be as stark as we signed fiscal year 23. And the growth, which is very important in a year like this, growth should be broad-based. I expect our core verticals to show broad-based growth. I expect our service lines to show broad-based growth. I expect growth across geos to be broad-based. And I expect client cohorts, I can't specifically call out one or two clients individually, but client cohorts, top five, top 10, top 20, top 50, should all be resilient and should be more or less like in line with the kind of guidance that we, that we provided and the planning that we've done. Uh, client specific regional banks, our exposure is minimal. The, the only material exposure that we have is to the relationship that we have with Fifth Third Bank it is largely centered around operations, not technology. I am speaking to you after having hosted the COO and the CIO in Bangalore the day before. That's a relationship that is only likely to grow. I see absolutely no contraction. We see absolutely no contraction. So that's how I would characterize things that we see them today. Okay, okay. And uh, in terms of adjusted EBITDA margin, when we are given the guidance at the Q3 result, uh, we were knowing about the forex hedge loss, which may be there for the nine months plus prediction for the fourth quarter. 
despite there uh, there is a miss on the guidance as a whole and how do you see the forex hedge loss uh, entering into fy24 as a whole it will continue to pain you on adjusted ebitda margin and also related question when do you expect your investment into sales marketing capability building would be largely over uh, because i think uh, despite a robust industry leading growth i think uh, uh, the sdn leverage is not turning out the way it should have been so uh, i mean uh, when we look at the numbers that we delivered uh, 60 bps negative was on account of hedge you right 9 months was baked in but uh, currency has been volatile through the year our exposure to europe is far more than our peers and you know this almost 40% of our revenue this quarter has come from europe based clients uh, and that's been one plane to it the second of course is gross margin has continued to climb very starkly we could through the quarter have decided that we will not invest any more and meet the 18 and a half guidance but we've taken a conscious call to make sure that we keep investing because fy24 is going to be a year which we do not see necessarily as a doom and gloom year normal commentary that we are hearing we see clear opportunities in the turns we see spaces like commercial speciality smb we see spaces like ctb in banking we see spaces like airlines airports hospitality as places where demand is likely to be resilient and in some cases growing actively so the intent was to make sure that we continue spending uh, we are at about 14 and a half odd percent on snm we would be absolutely okay with taking that number over time all the way up to 15% and capping it there so that's that's how we see it over time in the current context given the uncertainty in the macro prime the primary imperative is to meet the guidance that we've offered and a very strong incentive that all of us carry is to try to exceed it also if it is possible so that's how we're looking at it that's why we invested uh, and that's why we took a very conscious call that we would continue investing even while gross margin was going on was was going up and not just focus on meeting 18 and a half percent okay thanks and the question on the forex hedge uh, line expectation in the fy24 Ajay, would you like to take that? Uh, the expectation is uh, the the if you see the over the last one year, the uh, movement, uh, currency movement, and the hedges have been very very sharp, uh, and the INR has depreciated very sharply, and which has actually led to the losses uh, that that were there in in financial year 23. In financial year 24. uh if the, the currency stays where there is uh, obviously the loss would be much uh, lower and it will be uh, uh, it will not feel the gain but if the currency continues to uh, decline uh, in future the losses could be higher so it it all depends upon how uh, the currency movement happens in future Okay. Okay. And just a bookkeeping, sir. Uh, in terms of these ADR expenses, uh, I think the process has been started more than a year back. So why the provision now? And you are saying when the ADR listing happens, it will be recovered from a selling shareholders. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these expenses are for the ADR, and uh, these these were recoverable from the shareholders. so as we started uh, doing the adr the expenses were accrued and uh, were rec- uh, were uh, recorded as recoverable from the shareholders however given the uh, uh, the the situation and the market conditions we are in and uh, there is uh, obviously we are committed to the adr but there is a clear uh, there is no clear visibility when that will happen so from an accounting prudence perspective we have taken a provision uh, in this quarter and this still remains uh, recoverable from the shareholders it's a provision we have not uh, written this off so oh, thank you all the best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of shraddha agrawal from amsec please go ahead yeah hi congrats on a good revenue execution So just one question on the margin front. Uh, so the margin miss in this quarter was entirely because of hedge losses, or was there something else also that led to uh, margin hit against what was expected only? Because if I look at the hedge loss items, it was close to 13 crores last quarter versus 14 and a half crores that we took this time around. 
it's not much of a change on the QRQ basis, but margin expectation was about 70 bits increase versus what we have delivered is just 110 bits improvement. There was, uh, you're right, uh, Shada, but uh, margin did come in at uh, north of about 19.5%, right? So there was really nothing that was terribly unexpected. We could always have, and I said this in response to the earlier question, we could always have uh, toned down our spending through the quarter to meet the EBITDA numbers, but we took a very conscious call to continue to spend, and we will continue to spend in quarter one as well. As I said earlier, the deal pipelines are resilient. We expect quarter one also the deal pipeline to be resilient. So the last thing we want to do at a time like this, when there is revenue pressure, is to miss the revenue opportunity that exists out there in the market. Hence, we took a conscious call to do it. There was nothing on the on the margin front that came as a material negative surprise to the management. Because if I look at the tailwind that would have worked for us in this quarter was cross currency tailwind improvement in utilization and hedge loss not being materially different from what it was in the last quarter. But still, our margin limits were close to 60 bits versus what we had guided to. So we were just uh, looking at was there anything exceptional that went into beyond the hedge loss that we have been talking about. No, uh, uh, more than 100 uh, bits increase in margin is a very significant increase. Uh, 170 obviously has always been a stretch, especially in a year like that. If you look at our margin in FI23 versus FI22, and you compare that performance with some of our peers, I think we've held up very, very strongly. Even the 40 bits decrease that you see on an annual basis, 60 of that was accounted for by a hedge, loss, a hedge gain loss in annual. Net of that, margins performance perspective on a yearly basis went up 20 bits in a very, very tough year. So that's that's how I would characterize it, Shraddha. We remain confident around the margin guidance that we're giving for fiscal year 24. We will hold the line at the number that we are at on the adjusted EBITDA front, and we will continue to push to meet the revenue guidance and hopefully try to exceed it also. Sure, thank you. And the next question is, you know, we've had an impressive performance across client buckets, but if you look at the top five client performance, that's relatively, compared to other buckets, a bit soft. So uh, is there any client-specific challenge or, or was it broad-based softness because uh, relative to other buckets, that you relatively softer? No, I, I think in this case, it's a classic case of success being its own enemy, right? Um, if you do very well as a firm and then you start looking relatively, there's bound to be a cohort that will underperform versus the others. There's absolutely no issue with clients. Client relationships are resilient. Client relationships are strong. Client relationships are strengthening. And if I look at my top five or top ten clients, when we look internally at gross margins, we actually see margins expanding there. So we feel very, very solid about these from a pipeline perspective, from a resiliency perspective, from a from an ability to cross it and improve our footprint there perspective. And so the last bit, the salary hike cycle remains as a one Q and uh, what is the kind of margin drop that is expected in first quarter and what is the quantum of hike that we are envisaging? Early hikes uh, will happen as as committed to our employees. It's not just an issue of giving them hike and they're not giving them the hike. The hikes are going to happen. Uh, uh, there's, there's absolutely non-negotiable. Salary hikes, on an average, will be lower than the numbers that we've seen in terms of increments over the last quarter. When when the supply side was stressed, we went uh, we we went out, took a step out. It, higher than ordinary increments, and that's reflected in the very low depression that we've had. So, uh, so from, our, from our vantage, salary hikes will be lower. Margin, uh, the margin impact, however, will be more or less in line with the same kind of margin drops that we've seen in the past. Quarter one for us normally is about a 16.5% adjusted EBITDA quarter. Quarter four is somewhere around a 19.5% adjusted EBITDA quarter and we expect the same seasonality to play out. So it should be more or less the same by quarter in FI24 as it was in FI23. Sure, that's helpful. And one last question, if I can squeeze in. Uh, in BFS, do you see any delay in deal conversion cycle or any any impact on the pipeline buildup given the macro that we are talking about? For oh, BFS, Radha, we see an, a very significant deceleration next year in growth. This year, BFS for us has grown 47%. There's no scenario under which we expect it to register that kind of a growth in fiscal year 24. So the way we look at it is uh, BFS 
will more or less fall to the 15 to 16 percent kind of growth range, 13 to 16 or 15 to 16 percent kind of growth range from a 47 percent growth that we registered in FY23 in that space. There is a clear slowing down. There is clear cost pressure, but BFS is playing out in interesting ways, right? When you look at us, within BFS, we really play in only four areas. We play materially in asset and wealth management. We play in retail and commercial banking. We play in central banking, and we play in fintech disruption. Now, in, in, in this space, run the bank is where most of the pressure is. That entire run the bank space, there are there is significant cost pressure to try to drive cost out through automation, through transforming the workforce, to manage services, through extreme offshoring. Change the bank, especially security, especially data, especially compliance is still resilient. So those are the areas from which we will still see, we believe around 15% yearly growth, but the number will come down very drastically from the 47% that we saw. That's how we see it. Uh, and that's how I would answer you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and all the best for me. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Ashwin Mehta from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, my, most of our, my other questions have been answered. Just one clarification, I missed the point in terms of how much is the expense for iPads in, uh, in the next quarter? Yeah. Uh, Ashwin, the, the impact of the uh, gifts would be additionally, iPads would be only a, a couple of hundred K, but there are other celebrations that have been planned and total expenses for the billion dollar celebration is 1.7 million dollars in the next quarter. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think that's the one. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gaurav Rateria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question. So two questions. Firstly, what proportion of our business would be linked to cloud, whether it is migration or development work on the cloud? Secondly, a lot of people have talked about 2023 to be a year of cloud optimization. Are you seeing that in your own client base? And what is your expectation with respect to which service offering is going to see a slowdown, which service offering is going to be more resilient in the current macro context? Thank you. I'm sorry, can you build on what you mean by cloud optimization? Because we've been talking about cloud optimization for the last decade. So what do you mean by 2023 being a year of cloud optimization? A lot of the surveys uh, that is being done with the CIOs are talking about that people over committed to the cloud spend and 2023 is where they're trying to optimize and reduce it. And then it's a temporary issue. But uh, you know, wanted to hear it from you in terms of have you seen anything similar to that? Well, uh, I mean, Gaurav, let me take the second question first. Uh, what you're talking about is something that does impact hyperscalers, and I think that information is in the public realm, right? The hyperscalers have called down the revenue numbers, so clearly the cloud migration uh, activities are, are not seeing a, are not seeing a degradation, but they're clearly seeing a deceleration. So the numbers bear that, the data bears it, and that obviously is, is the hard truth, being straight away from the numbers that the hyperscalers are laying out. So we do see that, but our play. And I suspect the play of most of the SIs like, like us is less around the migration piece. It's more around how do you enable operations on the cloud. It's more around how do you make sure that ROI on, 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 on work that is done on the cloud is measurable, especially in an environment like this. And it's more around everything that you talk about in innovation terms, how does it get translated on the cloud. Now, from our vantage, cloud, uh, the cloud service line is a material service line. Uh, we would not expect it to grow at a slower pace than the rest of the firm, but possibly at a slower pace than the pace that we recorded in fiscal year 23. So that's how we're seeing, we're seeing cloud spends translating into revenue from our point of view playing out. Uh, did I answer your questions, both your questions? Yeah, that's very helpful. So any particular service offering that is seeing uh, like more impact uh, under the current macro context uh, in your portfolio than others? Uh, 
that would be helpful thank you so i'll tell you the ones that we see uh, actually expanding and the ones that are more impacted and this is all relative this is not absolute so i don't expect any service offering to start this uh, to start degrowing uh, service offerings where the demand is very positive still buoyant uh, the first one is low code no code particularly no code within low code no code the demand there is strong it is solid it is resilient the second one in an environment like this is integration so uh, integration continues to be unimpeded uh, and the third one i classify as being data especially more on the analytics side than on the tech data services side those three areas clear bright spots product engineering still a bright spot uh, people are talking about transformation going away but increasingly what was the legacy adm business is under pressure but product engineering which fundamentally is all about full stack developers under a scrum pod based models continued demand despite the slowing down so those are the areas that we see on a relative basis we see demand outpacing the other service lines again on a relative basis trying this back to your earlier question cloud on a relative basis the demand has gone down compared to the other service lines so cloud clearly an area that is cloud infra clearly an area in most of the verticals with the exception of travel is the space that is under stress travel of course as a vertical continues to be buoyant right when i look at our travel client base we see a more committed a more confident spend on technology for the next 12 months because of a return to profitability because of the increased business demand particularly airports and airlines so there even cloud is resilient but for the others i would i would stick with what i just called out thank you so much thanks sir thank you next question is from the line of manik tanisha from access capital please go ahead hi uh, thank you for the opportunity we just wanted to get your thoughts around the fact that we've seen our offshore revenue mix increase materially over the course of last 3 years how do you see this playing out over the next 12 to 24 months and uh, and also a related question to our segmental margin performance uh, uh, what is driving the significant drop off in terms of our segmental margins uh in india as well as america thank you sure so i'll, I'll take uh, i'll take question number one around offshore and ajay i'll request the sarab you to take uh, question number two offshore we're at about uh, 51 odd percent right now manik i i believe from our size all the, the journey up to 2 billion dollars the cap will be about 54 55 i don't expect us to be galloping towards that cap anytime soon if you look at us over the last eight quarters you'll find that the rate of offshore revenue increase has been decelerating last quarter again at the clear point of the road so that's how we see it we're at 51 we used to be at 36 about two two and a half years back so we've obviously galloped our way to 51 i see the pace of growth now decelerating uh and possibly inching towards a 53 54 if all if all goes well segmental margin sajay all yours Yes, uh, Saro, would you like to take that question? Okay, uh, thank you, Ajay. So, uh, I think the reason why we are looking at a uh, little stress in margins, a little drop in margins between EMEA and uh, US, uh, so there are two factors there. One, obviously, the growth that has come in, there are investments that have been done at the front end. So, when we look at our margins for the geographies, it also includes the investment that has gone into SNM. So the large factor come in is is actually the SNM investments and the capability investments that have been done at the front end. Sure. Thank you. Now the rest of the future. Thank you, Manik. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Hi. Yeah, uh, good morning and thanks for taking your question. Uh, See, our guidance um, uh, and order book uh, conversion, uh, it, uh, it appears it is at the lower end of uh, what we have achieved historically. Uh, but still, it needs 250 to $300 million of you know, additional uh, revenues coming in through uh, new deals, etc. through FY24. Now, in the current environment where uh, you know most of our peers have seen unforeseen ramp downs or instances of vendor consolidation, etc., do you see any risk? 
to the guidance that 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 we have given um and and uh, have you seen in our uh, client base uh, you know any instances where we might have lost out in a uh, vendor consolidation scenario to large larger fields uh, thank you uh, uh, i mean there's always risk uh, abhishek it's a question of whether that's a theoretical risk or a practical risk uh, look at our track record the guidance that we've given at the beginning of the year is a guidance on revenue that we've always met and, and actually exceeded and, and our record really over the years has been somewhere around quarter two or quarter three we go ahead revise it and revise it upwards and then close the year and close it ahead of the of the uh, of the revised guidance that we provided so i mean if the question is is there a risk to the guidance i guess the honest answer to that is there's always a risk to any guidance but uh, practically do we see a risk uh, and how significant is the risk we don't we, we feel pretty confident is how i would call it out of the numbers that we provided of meeting them uh, and as i have said repeatedly on the call the intent will be to exceed them uh, and we'll see how how the year pans out uh, on a client basis we have seen absolutely no instance with any material client where under a consolidation exercise we got edged away it's a question that i have received a lot i understand there are some theoretical concepts out there the large size players can come in and start displacing the mid sized ones we don't believe in believe, believe in it we don't buy into it we have not seen it and we will not allow it if, if there's one thing we pride ourselves on it is execution execution means being in the trenches with our clients and knowing what's going to happen to their business and what their decision pattern is in the quarters and the months to come we like to think we've done an exceptional job over the last 6 years of doing that and at this point in time we've seen absolutely no displacement out we anticipate under any circumstance absolutely no displacement out so that's that's the answer to the question that you posed the question thank you uh, and all the best thanks thank you The next question is on the line of Abhishek Shindatkar from Incred Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity and congrats on a good quarter. I just wanted to understand, um, you know, the growth rates in the fresh order intake and the executable book. So last year, um, you know, the executable book growth was lower than the fresh intake, while this year it is the other way around. So how should we read that uh, from a perspective of, uh, you know, the quality of book uh, and the tenure of book? Uh, if you can explain that, that could be helpful. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, you're very welcome, Abhishek. Thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, I can't pass through order intake versus executable numbers on, on on the spot, but what I can tell you is, if you look at the last six years, Abhishek, and I'm not talking one, two, or three years. Look at the last six years. If you look at the movement on order executable, which we call out every quarter, and you tag that with the actual revenue growth delivered over the next twelve quarters, there's been a very, very strong correlation. I did point out that we closed the quarter. at an order with an order executable number of 869 million dollars that number is 20% higher than where the same number was at the same time last year so we derive a lot of comfort from that order executable piece the other thing also that i very explicitly called out is even in a quarter like quarter 4 two large deals got signed and we did call out that quarter 1 that we are already into almost a month into is a quarter where we expect the deal velocity large deal velocity to continue so a lot of the confidence comes from that uh order executable has had a very strong correlation to actual revenue growth and our intent will be to make sure that we don't lose that correlation in the year to come uh that's that's helpful uh, what i was trying to understand is that um, you know a fresh order intake growth lower than the uh, you know growth of executable order book over the next 12 months uh, you, you know historically i mean the assumption right now is that there are a lot of cost efficiency deals which are larger in tenure so uh, you know that should have been reflected in this growth rates also while uh, you know the near term transformation deals or shorter term projects Uh, are more subsiding what the thought process general perception is so should we read anything from these two growth numbers and kind of correlate to the mix of book or maybe you know we are thinking too far sir we are closer to these numbers than i am do you want to take a stab at the answer yeah so i think last year when we looked at uh, order intake growth uh, being higher than the executable i mean we had a 
large deal coming in which was spanning over five year period so what is happening this year is i think most of the deals that have come in they are around three year period so i think when you look at intake as a growth in the intake it also is a function of five year versus three year deals getting signed so that's one but uh, but as sudhir mentioned the, when you derive comfort from the next year projections that actually comes in from the 12 month executable because every deal we carve it and then uh, and, and 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 derive what will be the next 12 month or uh, 24 months or 36 months revenue so i think it's um, it's more about one or two large deals getting signed which is longer term period and that's where the intake growth in a particular year will be reflected very very high but i think there is nothing more to read beyond that but, but when we look at our projections our immediate growth numbers for next 6 to 12 months the comfort that we derive is more from a 12 month executable order perfect this question around yeah this question around client outlook and order is coming quite a bit do you want to provide some quick comment here on what you seeing with the key accounts in the csr yeah i mean the, the, i mean you actually covered a lot of the points i was actually going to 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 flag up i think quite a lot of benefit from our positioning and the fact is that you mentioned the um the relation the deep relationship the bottom up approach we're in the trenches we always pride ourselves on execution and this is actually positioned ourselves very very well where there are significant cost outs because they come to us with our technology capability to drive those cost take outs and so i i actually see it as a positive sign in many respects for us as an organization that's um thanks john thanks sir thank you abhishek uh, thank you for taking my question thanks everyone thank i think that was the time we had for the last question and we can take other questions offline uh, with everyone um go ahead thank you ladies and gentlemen that would be our last question for today i now hand the conference over to mr sudhir singh ceo coforge limited for closing comments thank you and over to you sir thank you very very much we mean this very sincerely uh, a lot of us actually all of us on the call are going to remember this day very very fondly it's the day we crossed the billion dollars and uh, we think it's fantastic that we got to start the day out here in india uh, with all of you so early morning thank you very much for your time for your interest for your comments and for your insights look forward to seeing you next quarter bye bye thank you very much Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Forge Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.